Hi. Um, I, it's really a, a privilege uh, to be here to talk about our Hope Bridges program, which Mary was supposed to give this talk. Mary is really the prime driver of development of this dream that we have of, of bridging between clinic visits, one clinic visit and the other, bridging to what's going on in the home and making sure that we're attentive to the needs that happen in the continuum between visits. So Mary uh, is really plays uh, several roles. She's our educational programs coordinator and liaison between the clinic and our board of directors at the ALS Hope Foundation. But she also is a program coordinator and mental health specialist of our neurodegenerative disease center and specifically our ALS Center of Hope. And so she uh, does a lot of the work here. And we all know the need. I mean, motor neuron disease, ALS and motor neuron disease is rapidly progressive. There's a loss of independence. The, you know, the platform is always changing. It's a never ever changing landscape. There's a multitude of changing care needs and a lot goes on in the three months between clinic visits. And during clinic visits, there's really limited time. You have three to four hours with the clinic team. You're overwhelmed, especially during your first visits when you receive a diagnosis. And even though we send people home with a list, a to-do list and a information about what we talked about, many times uh, that's forgotten. They're just overwhelmed. And there's this roller coaster of emotions and, and new stressors. So given that, we wanted to bridge that need between clinic visits to, to really underscoring what went on in clinic and to assess needs as they arise even between clinic visits. And you know, some of the problems that we see is you know, in, in our practice uh, or in our area was really the lack of access to specialized care in the home um, and support. Uh, since COVID, it's really hard to even find a home health aide, let alone a home health aide who's consistent, who shows up, and who knows anything about ALS. And the same thing for the agencies that send them. Uh, and then the delays that occur because somebody goes home and they need a piece of equipment, and it's not until the next clinic visit that that need comes up. That's a three-month delay. So, so we wanted to bridge those gaps, and that's how the Hope Bridges program developed. And so, you know, some of the ways, how do we do this? Some of the solutions that we had were, well, we can do interval home visits or video, virtual visits, depending on uh, the, the person and where they live, and, and these have to be done by uh, experienced uh, ALS professionals, either our team members or typically Mary or somebody that, that knows uh, the, the PALS. And we want to focus those, those visits in that interval, uh, have to focus on the emotional support and, and answering questions, home safety. We want to assess the equipment needs in the home life planning and care coordination. And coordination's a big word. We have many different agencies that work with our pals and, and we need to coordinate everyone and we at the clinic need to know what's going on in the home. And we need to provide outreach and we really feel strongly about education to the community care organizations that are caring for our pals. They often don't understand ALS and the unique needs of motor neuron disease. And we want to result in an overall decrease in the stress and the feeling of overwhelming, uh, uh, the overwhelming nature of the disease. We want to reduce that and really improve support and care. And we don't want it to cost anything to families. They've got enough to worry about. And so some of our specifics, we actually have three phases. The initial phase, that overwhelming phase when you first get that that explosion in your life, that you, you get the diagnosis of ALS. And then the sort of continuum, and then sort of as the disease accelerates or changes and you really have to make some end of life decisions and some major decisions, that third phase. So initially, uh, somebody comes to clinic and they get the diagnosis. We want to do a visit within one month where uh, our ALS trained nurse, i.e. Mary, who's a mental health specialist, in conjunction with our service coordinator, 
goes to the home or does a video visit to, to further disease education, to reinforce what was learned in the, in the clinic, to answer any questions that, that re remain, to assess the family and psychosocial situation. What is the landscape in that home? And what support network is there? And, and what is that home environment? Are we gonna have to really start to prep a family for, hey, you better add a bedroom downstairs or think about moving or put a downstairs bathroom in? Uh, is, what does the pals want? Does, does the person still want to maintain uh, work life? And can we do something to help them reach their goals? We wanna to begin to talk about decision making and I want that decision tool from Les Turner. That's a great decision tool. I think we're gonna implement that. Thank you for developing it. Uh, and and we, want, we want to teach them coping skills and, and assess their ability to cope. And with this, taking that back to our team, we can develop an individualized care plan and treatment plan for ongoing care for that person. It's a holistic approach. And, once we get through that first phase and things are starting to settle down, we, we actually do routine monthly check-in communication and determine as needed home visits and video visits with a physician, nurse, mental health, or other therapists, physical, occupational, respiratory, speech, even massage therapists for pain management to help with some of the spasticity, dietitian, patient services coordinator, whatever we determine is needed, either in clinic or during our one monthly phone calls. And uh, you know, we, we identify if we're going to do that home visit or if we can identify a community service that can do that, that visit and be educated. In addition, we're going, to, we're going to look at the equipment needs and we have two ways to supply equipment and fill that gap. Uh, we, we have the, lo the equipment that we have in clinic that we hand out at the time, boogie boards, you know, we, uh, we have neck collars and little items that uh, ADL equipment that we save them the trouble of having to figure out where to get it. They just go home with it. And I can't tell you how many pals come to clinic and they're writing on paper and there's paper all over the room because they're writing and I just give them the boogie board and I say, use this. It's a lot easier and, you know, they love it and then we talk with the boogie board. And then we also have, through good fortune and a donation by the Pappas family, uh, a large warehouse where we can put larger equipment including power wheelchairs, uh, walkers, rollators, and other pieces of equipment that we can immediately get to, to people who need it rather than waiting while, while they get measured up and get their, their power wheelchair. As I said, we do the monthly calls to reassess and make sure things are going on. And then we also have virtual support group meetings. We have them for PALS, for CALS, and we also have instituted meetings for, the, for people with PLS because they feel kind of excluded in everything and, and we feel that that's a, an area that also needs support. And then of course, as time progresses, we sort of increase uh, the home visits and video visits to really make sure we're keeping up with the equipment needs, do final decision making, caregiver and family support. And this is usually physician, i.e. myself, or, or uh, Mary, the mental health specialist or social worker. And we wanna make sure that we educate on comfort measures if people choose uh, not to intervene in any other way and uh, call in hospice at the appropriate time, but make sure hospice is educated on ALS uh, and uses the ALS paradigm. And uh, of course, the ongoing assessment of AAC, Hoyers, hospital beds, as, as more and more equipment needs to come into the house. And that's when those baseline evaluations are so critical because we're gonna anticipate that Oh, the Hoyer lift isn't gonna fit in. Where are we gonna put the hospital bed, et cetera? And all of that has to be coordinated between home care services and our team and uh, make sure that everyone knows what's going on. And increasingly, we have to coordinate, educate folks on medical decisions. Dad has a cough, dad can't breathe, what do we do? 
We have to be accessible and make sure that they know what to do. And if we send people to the emergency room or to the hospital, we have to be in communication with those healthcare professionals to make sure we're advising them on why we sent someone and getting information back about the result of that and taking that to the care plan. Um, and always educating about ALS to anyone who is not informed. And if we look at our current outcomes, we've uh, now, we started this program in March of 20 and then what happened? COVID hit. So, so we really got it going in March of 22. We've had 46 virtual mental health and care coordination visits, 16 home visit, family home visits, uh, really to do family counseling, 10 virtual visits from therapists, 32 support meetings, and we hope that it's led to improved care coordination and support of our families and decreased the time to interventions, uh, but we have to do the metrics, and that's what we're involved in now, and over the next year, we'll be gaining metrics uh, be on the number of interventions between visits, what type of interventions, and most importantly, getting input from our pals and cals about what they think of the program, how we can make it better, how we can meet their needs better, and if they feel supported and their needs coordinated. Um, you know, we have to consider staffing. We're trying to grow our staff. Of course, that always means money. Right now, we have poor Mary doing all the mental health and, and nurse coordination. Uh, we uh, want to coordinate services. We need to identify when somebody actually needs a, a professional, who that professional should be, and the communication has to be there between the professional in the home and, and the team to make sure that there's appropriate follow-up. Sometimes it'll be our follow-up to a home care agency telling them what we think needs to get done. There's always liability if you go into the home. And of course, you need funding and sustainability, and, and we want to maintain no cost to families for these kinds of services. And so we have our Hope Bridges Fund, and, and we now have the Gino Caracello Fund, started by Maria Caracello, who lost her husband to ALS, and who really uh, appreciated our home visits and realized the need for ALS-trained healthcare professionals in the home. She felt like she was doing all the education when the home care workers came in and, and uh, really uh, was one of the driving forces uh, and influenced this program and, of course, applying for grants. And we couldn't do this without a good team. We, uh, we see the need and we have a vision and a desire to do better in, in that interval period and to bridge those gaps to brainstorming and some creative uh, options, and we need to ask uh, for people to give their talents, their brains, their efforts, and, and their support to this program. And I have to thank Mary uh, Payalone, uh, Jamie uh, Piggott, who's our executive director, who's embraced the program, Sarah Feldman, who's really taken the lead on the, on the uh, ancillary support, or additional uh, prof healthcare professionals. Lisa Cassidy is our, our primary contracted physical therapist who goes into the home. She lost her husband to ALS, and she's well acquainted with the needs and has a passion for this uh, program. Uh, the Maria Caracello, uh, who uh, really had some vision as well for this program, and the Pappas family, and all those people who have helped us, and really the pals and cows who inspire us every day and, and for whom we just want to make a difference and do better. So uh, we've identified some, some gaps in care and needs and tried to come up with some creative ways to address it. We want to collaborate with home care and we want to educate other home care companies, hospices. We want to partner with other organizations to expand bridging programs to all PALS. Uh, and provide education to all agencies. Anyone who goes into that home should understand the disease. Uh, and we need to seek support to expand these programs, not only for us, but for others. And we need to keep hope on the horizon. Thank you very much. Thank you That's for that That's a hard giving someone else's lecture. <laughs> no, you did a great job. Thank you so much for that presentation. Some great um, support there. It's great um, evidence and um, experience. So 
maybe I can ask a question first, uh, which was around the sustainability. There's so much input and uh, resource needed. Yeah, How is the program sustainable financially? Well, because it's right now we're doing it with our own personnel who are there anyway and sustained otherwise, but that's, that was our point about we need to grow the support infrastructure um, with grants and, and um, typically a, a lot of support comes from families who are thankful for what it gave to them. That's how we got the Carousello Fund, which really has is, is raised quite a bit of money for, for these purposes. Thank you. So perhaps we can open up the uh, floor to questions. Can I see any? Yes, just one here. There's two, actually. Uh, Gethin Thomas, MND Australia. Um, are you confident to have the discussions around sort of, I guess, bigger decisions such as PEG or something oh, around that virtually, or do you no, tend that, to do those face in, to face? That's really done in clinic, but it's reinforced in the home. Uh, you, the only time you're really forced into a virtual visit and other clinicians in the office can attest to this is when people won't come into clinic and we're forced into virtual visits even for their clinic visits. The way we run our, our virtual visits is literally it's like a multidisciplinary visit. I start the Zoom and um, I individually see the patient for about half an hour, 45 minutes, and then my team joins me. So you see this whole, it looks like some of those, in what David showed us, you know, all these people on the Zoom. And, and you know, I summarize for each Care, team member what I think those their issues are physical therapy occupational therapy you know speech respiratory nutrition you know I'll say hey we need to address this uh, but that would be the only instance where I wouldn't broach it first and and I actually talk about it although I'm not sure how much is heard even on the first visit when I talk about some of the decisions that you may have to consider and I think that's where the decision tool that we have will be be very useful and again I thank Les Turner for that yeah. There's I hope that answered your question, Gethin. There's a question just behind the pillow. I can't actually see yeah. somebody, but I saw a hand. Hi. My question is, do you have any home care partner training program? Because as we know, the home care partner may not be knowledgeable to handle the illness patient. So do you have any training modules for them? Yeah. Um, so that's one of the things that we clearly want to do. We do do education for a home care workers uh, and for home when they'll accept us coming out to the agency and giving a program on ALS because they have people in the home. In addition, we will send um, a professional out to show home health aides how to use the equipment. And in clinic, we often make videos on how to range. We'll say, okay, got your camera, and we'll make a video. And we are working to make some videos that will be up on a website and we've also worked uh, with your ALS guide to help do some videos that, that will educate people. But you're absolutely right. That's, that's a clear need in the community that, that we also see. And we'll, that'll be part of our addressing the needs. People have to watch it, though. And, and the agencies have to want us to come out and do the educational program. And we do try to do that. We're always willing to talk to anyone. That's part of our which we're not talking about, our Hope Educates program. So we have a program also that's called Hope Educates that we basically say we'll educate anyone on ALS and, and how you care for people with ALS. Thank you. Uh, I think there's a question on the line. Oh. Can a lion make a, like a training program? Can a lion make a uh, video or like a proper training certification program? So that from all over the world, we can have a home care worker attend and, and uh, get certified so that they can be useful 
Well, that's an idea is to create a certification program for ALS workers. What we do in Hope Educates, people can come to our clinic, they get a lecture on ALS, and then they get to sit in with the PALS or CALS with the PALS permission and see exactly what each professional does and what it means to have ALS. We, we think that's really important for, for everybody to understand. But that's a very good idea is to create a certification for home care of ALS, people living with ALS. I think there was another question back there. And okay. No, I think there was, there was one online as well, I think. So okay. we've got time yeah. for probably another couple of quick questions. Nothing online. Nothing online, okay. Good. <laughs> Does that mean I'm done? Thank you. Well, not <laughs> you really a question. The question. Oh, thank you, Dr. Hyman Patterson. Uh, Tracy Ali, one of the VPs of Care Services for the ALS Association. I just really want to thank you more of a comment for your, um, your talk about uh, the need for a decision-making tool and the holistic approach to care. And um, we also are working on the build-out of a decision-making tool and the Les uh, Turner Foundation's um, uh, work is so phenomenal. So thank you for your comments around that. Yes, and I, I hope that we're able to partner with Les Turner and translate uh, their tool into to Spanish in, when I wear my healthcare disparities hat and we're trying to promote health equity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hyman Patterson. Thank you very much. Thank you.